But we are very fortunate to be living in a time when we can join together across the lines of historic theological division and work in common for the foundational principles of our civilization, like the sanctity of human life, the dignity of marriage, the rights of conscience and religious freedom. And the Manhattan Declaration is, as Bishop Corleone says, a watershed moment bringing together evangelical Protestant Christians, Catholics, both Roman Catholics and our Eastern Rite Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, and uh, members of the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches, including leaders of all three of these great historic uh, traditions, to work in common. I, you, you, needn't, uh, you don't need me to remind you uh, that there was a time when cooperation across those kinds of religious lines was uh, not uh, by any means the norm, not by any means common. Uh, my great friend Hadley Arcus talks, uh, tells me about growing up uh, uh, in the 1930s in a suburb of Chicago that was so rife with uh, religious prejudice that when a Unitarian family moved into town, the Ku Klux Klan came and burned a question mark on their lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are gone. We're now working together. At least some of us are working together. And the Evangelicals and Catholics and Orthodox are really working together on the Manhattan Declaration. And Bishop Corleone, thank you for your patronage of the Manhattan Declaration and your activism on its behalf. We fight for causes as noble as any for which any human beings have uh, fought. And uh, it's uh, in some ways a shame that we have to stand up for such fundamental values, but we should consider ourselves honored uh, to be the ones who have the privilege of standing up for these values. A contest of worldviews in our time pits devout Catholics, evangelicals, and other conservative Protestants, Eastern Orthodox Christians, members of the Latter-day Saints Church, the Mormons, Orthodox Jews, and other believers against liberal secularists and those who, while remaining within the religious uh, denominations, Protestant and Catholic and Jewish, have adopted ideas about personal and political morality that are in line with what is regarded, in fact, if not in name, as orthodoxy uh, in secular sectors of uh, society or sectors of our society in which liberal secularism is dominant. The contest of worldviews manifests itself most importantly, though not exclusively, in disputes over life issues, such as abortion and infanticide, cloning and embryo destructive research, and physician assisted suicide and euthanasia, as well as debates about sex, marriage, and family life and religious freedom and the role of religion in American public life, the issues with which the Manhattan Declaration is centrally concerned. Now, I'm hardly the first person to recognize the existence of this conflict of worldviews. People on both sides of the debate have noticed it, commented on it, and proposed ideas about how an essentially democratically constituted polity ought to come to terms with this level and depth of disagreement. The trouble, of course, is that the issues dividing the two camps are of such profound moral significance on either side's account, on either side's account, that merely procedural solutions are not good enough. That is to say, neither side will be happy to agree on decision procedures for resolving key differences at the level of public policy where the procedures do not virtually guarantee victory for the substantive policies they happen to favor. Now this is not a matter of people on either side being irrationally stubborn or hung up on a desire to win. Rather, it reflects the considered judgment of people on both sides that non-negotiable issues of justice, human rights, and the common good are at stake. Now, I find myself on one side of the divide, the side that is generally, for whatever good or bad reasons, identified in our media as the conservative side. I don't think labels matter much. But in any event, I'm grateful for the opportunity this evening to share with you some of the considerations that led me to where I stand. From the outset, though, I want to state that I regard those who find themselves on the opposite side as reasonable people of goodwill who, like me, 
are doing their best to figure out the truth and to conduct their lives with integrity in its light. Our differences are, to be sure, profound. But I regard those of my fellow citizens who disagree with me as intellectual and political opponents, to be sure, but not as mortal enemies. A great many are my personal friends. You can imagine swimming in the waters in which I swim. Most of the people with whom I swim do not agree with me about these great and foundational issues. And they are as filled or more filled with moral passion uh, than I am about the issues. They see themselves as fighting for what is right, right and true and good, just as I see myself as fighting for what is right and true and good. I regard myself duty-bound, therefore, to treat them with respect and civility, even as I ask to be treated that way by them. I owe it to them to listen carefully to their arguments, which I have always tried to do, and consider them in an honest and fair-minded way. They are seeking to serve the cause of justice and human rights, just as I am. I may think and do think that they are seriously misguided in their judgments, but I am not infallible, nor are they. Either side could be wrong or only partially right. Whatever our differences on the great questions of justice and human rights and the common good and however much, we are conscience bound to struggle against each other with determination, the domain of politics. We are bound together in a very fundamental way as fellow citizens, fellow Americans, and fellow human beings. The contemporary clash of worldviews is sometimes depicted as a battle between the forces of faith and those of reason. Uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, my former colleague in, uh, at New College in Oxford, where I had many lunches with him, depicts it this way. As far as Richard is concerned, one side is the side of irrational faith, and the other side is the side of scientific reason. Now, I propose this evening to challenge this de depiction in a particular and fundamental way. I'll argue that the Judeo-Christian moral view is not only rationally defensible, but that Judeo-Christian moral teaching can be shown to be rationally superior to orthodox secular moral beliefs. In defending the rational strength of Christian morality, I do not mean either to denigrate faith or to deny the importance, indeed the centrality, of God's revealed word in the Bible or of sacred tradition. My aim is to offer a philosophical defense of key points of Judeo-Christian morality and to put forward a challenge to the secularist worldview that has established itself as an orthodoxy in the academy, those waters in which I swim, and other elite sectors of Western culture, such as in uh, the mainstream media, in the large professional associations, and so forth. So let's uh, first get clear about what's at stake in the conflict between Christian and Jewish and, to a large extent, Islamic morality and the secularist orthodoxy. Again, the issues most immediately in play have mainly, though not exclusively, to do with sexuality, the transmitting and taking of human life, and the place of religious and re religion and religiously informed moral judgment in public life. According to the secularist orthodoxy, a child prior to birth or some other marker event sometime before or soon after birth, such as the emergence of detectable brainwave function or the acquisition of self-awareness, has no right to be killed, no right not to be killed at the direction of its mother, no right at least that the law may legitimately recognize and protect. That's essentially the holding in Roe versus Wade. At the other edge of life, orthodox secularists believe that every individual has a right to commit suicide and to be assisted in committing suicide should that person, for whatever reason, prefer death to life. In short, orthodox secularism rejects the proposition central to the Judeo-Christian tradition that human life is intrinsically and not merely instrumentally good and therefore morally inviolable. It, reject, it rejects traditional morality's condemnation of abortion, embryo-destructive biomedical research, suicide, the infanticide of so-called defective children, and certain other life-taking acts. 